And today's message is entitled, The Spirit's Passion for Souls. The Spirit's Passion for Souls. How many of y'all glad that you're born again? How many of y'all are thrilled that you're going to heaven and not going to hell? How many of y'all are glad that you've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of His dear Son? How many of y'all are glad that you're a born-again, blood-bought, spirit-filled, Bible-believing, devil-chasing, water-walking, dead man-raising, Holy Ghost, hallelujah, child of the living God? How many of y'all glad that the Holy Ghost was passionate about you? You know, as happy as you are that you're a born-again believer, the Holy Ghost is happier. You know, before you ever knew Jesus, before you ever came to Jesus, before you ever surrendered to the Lord, the Holy Ghost had you on His mind. And He was poking you, and He was prodding you, and He was after you. And the day you came to Jesus, the Holy Ghost said, It's about time, buddy. I, come on. I've been... I've been after you for a long time. And as passionate as the Holy Spirit is about your soul, that is how passionate the Holy Spirit is about every other soul that is upon planet Earth. The Holy Spirit is passionate about souls. You could not be born again unless the Holy Spirit was passionate about you. That's why we call it being born of the Spirit. When you're born again, you're born of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you. And that passion that God has for souls, for God so loved the world, He wants the world to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Whoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. The passion that the Holy Spirit has for souls lives in the heart of the believer. I didn't get enough amens. The, the passion that the Holy Spirit has for souls lives on the inside of the believer. I am so thrilled that God never gave up on me. How about you? I'm so thrilled. And we did some crazy things, didn't we? Uh, we were out of his will at times, weren't we? Aren't you glad he didn't quit? Aren't you glad he didn't give up? Aren't you glad he was passionate about you? Aren't you glad he didn't say, that's it, I'm done, they're out of here, forget it. No, he's passionate. I said he's passionate. He didn't give up on Saul before Saul became Paul. God met him on a Damascus road and said, listen, we got to straighten some things out. I'm so glad that Saul said, yes, Lord, what would you have me to do? Some of us met Jesus on a Damascus road. Some of us met Jesus at the altar in a church. Some of us met Jesus in one way or another. But aren't you glad that we came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Don't you wish everybody would? God wants everybody to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you're in Matthew 28, verse 16... Look there with me. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. Verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now this is a post-resurrection revelation of Jesus. This is after the cross. Verse 19. Here's the commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And the church said, Amen. Oh, what a great commission. Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever things I have commanded you. Well, in the parallel version, in, in the complementary version in Mark 16, verse 15, it says, Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What a great commission that is. That is a commission that is assigned to the church. And it is a commission to affect the entire world. 
Go save the world. Bring every breathing soul into the kingdom of God. Preach this gospel from one end of the globe to the other end of the globe and touch every ear, touch every heart, win every soul to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And the church said amen. That's a big, 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 big commission. But God has given us the power through the Holy Spirit to do it. And the church said, Amen. Do you know that the things that you are passionate about, you talk passionately about them? <laughs> if you're passionate about food, uh, you talk passionately about food. <laughs> Don't you really? If you're passionate about cars, you talk passionately about cars. If you're passionate about sports, you talk passionately about sports, about entertainment, about whatever it may be. The things that you are passionate about, those are the things that you talk passionately about. Because you want to share your joy with somebody else. If you just ate at a restaurant that you absolutely love, you're going to tell folks, you know what, I just ate at the best pizza joint in America. You've got to eat this pizza. It's fantastic pizza. In fact, let me take you to the pizza place. I'll buy you a slice of that pizza because I want you to taste it. I want you to enjoy it. And you'll eat no place else the rest of your life. All you're going to eat is pizza. Pizza, 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 I'm sure of it. If you're passionate about it, that's exactly the way. Or if you're a golfer and you get that new driver out, come on somebody, and you say, oh man, that's the best, I've never hit a ball like that before in my life. This driver, everybody should have a driver like this. Oh, I got to tell the world about this driver. Well, whatever you are passionate about, that is what you're going to talk passionately about. Amen. Isn't that right? Growing up, I had a very, very good friend, and his father was an environmentalist. Um, they, they came from Sweden. He loved the country, loved the environment in this country. And so he spent a lot of times as he was raising his kids up, uh, hiking and canoeing and out in the wilds. And just because he loved the environment, and he wanted his children to have the same love for the environment. And because I was a friend of one of his sons, I got to go with them on many, many trips, white water rafting and all this kind of nonsense. I got to do all those, those kind of things with them. Uh, when I went to his funeral, the, uh, one of the speakers there said, uh, he became a very good friend, uh, and he said, he said, the first time that I met Mr. Elger, that was his name, the first time that I met him, uh, he came to my office. Mr. Elger was a professor at the university, and this fellow had been hired in the same department. He said he came to my office on the first day, and he says, listen, I want to take you on an adventure today. And he said, really, this is my first day at work. Where are we going? He said, I'm going to take you to the river. And he said, he did. We got in his canoe going down the river, and I experienced the, the rivers and the springs of Florida for the very first time in my life. Now, why did he do this? This is this man talking. He said, why did he do this? He said, because he wanted me to fall in love with his river. He said, if he could get me on the river, he knew I would love the river. And if I would love the river, I would promote the river. I would protect the river. Amen. The body of Christ wants exactly the same thing for everybody. We want to get everybody into the river. Come on, that river of the Holy Ghost that flows from the throne of God. We know if we can get folks into the river, they're going to love the river. They're going to promote the river. They don't want to swim in any other river. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we talk about the things that we love. I, I love this restaurant. You need to come to this restaurant. Or I love this car. You need to, to drive this car. Or I love this sport. Or I love this or that or whatever it might be. But you know what? It, it, the restaurant that you go to doesn't make any difference. The sports that you enjoy doesn't make any difference. The car that you drive doesn't make any difference. I'll tell you what does make a difference. Heaven or hell. Your eternity, where you spend eternity, makes a difference. 
Where you spend eternity makes a difference because there is no turning back. If you eat at a restaurant that you don't like, there's 10 more down the road that you can enjoy. But if you end up in eternity where you don't want to be, there's no turning back. You've got to make the decision now where you're going to spend the rest of your life. Hallelujah. And here's the truth. Everybody, everybody is standing at the threshold of eternity. I don't care if you got one day or 120 years. And in the terms of eternity, that's a blink of the eye. Every one of us, every one of us is standing at the threshold of eternity. And here's the good news. Jesus has made a way. Jesus has sent out the invitations. Jesus has paid the price. Jesus has done the work. There is nothing left that we have to do other than surrender our heart and say, yes Lord by your grace I extend my faith and I receive you as my Lord and Savior that's an eternal decision I'm so glad that Jesus was passionate about me aren't you I'm so glad that the Holy Ghost pursued after me how about you I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit never gave up on us. And as much as he loved us and as much as he pursued us and as much as he goaded us to the foot of the cross, that's exactly what he is doing with every other person on planet earth every single person that we walk past today has an eternity every single person that we walk past today is going to either spend eternity in heaven or they're going to spend eternity in a devil's hell and we have a responsibility I hope it is a passion we have a passion to reach out with them for them with a gospel that has saving grace in it to tell them you can spend eternity in heaven with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the church has a great commission go into all the world disciple every nation teaching them to observe whatsoever things I've commanded you we are evangelistic in nature evangelistic I have a little slide about what that means to be evangelistic means to be a messenger of with glad tidings or a messenger with good news evangelistic evangel means if you look at the root word angel is right in the middle of it e angel ist evangelist an angel simply means messenger in scripture a passenger can be an angel uh, a pastor can be an angel or a spirit being can be an angel but all that means is that they have a message they're a messenger well, we are messengers with the greatest message that has ever been uttered from the lips of God. We're evangelists. We've got it. And we have a big commission to fulfill. But we have a big helper. We've got a big commission. Win the world. Disciple nations. Do you believe nations can be one to Jesus Christ? Disciple nations. But we have a big helper as well in the Holy Spirit. That's why when you talk about Pentecost and you talk about the commission, they go hand in hand. The word Pentecost is the uh, word regarding the harvest feast. It is a revelation that the harvest has come in. Penta means 50. It's 50 days after the Passover, and it regards the harvest feast. The Spirit was poured out on the Feast of Pentecost because the Spirit outpouring and empowering the church is an uh, empowerment for the harvest of souls to come into the kingdom. When you look at the feast seasons, you're looking at the redemptive plan of God. You look at Passover. Jesus had to be crucified on Passover because he was the Lamb of God. Jesus was raised on the feast of first fruits because he is the first fruits of the dead. Jesus sent the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost because it is the empowerment for the 
harvest. Jesus is going to sound a trumpet and come back on what I believe is going to be the Feast of Trumpets. I don't know that for sure, but I believe it. It makes sense. It goes along with the plan, and we're all going to be raptured away at the Feast of Trumpets. I don't know exactly when, where, or how. <laughs> covering myself, baby, covering myself. <laughs> that's throwing it out there and pulling it back in throwing it out and pulling it back in come on somebody hallelujah hallelujah but my point is this is that when you're talking about Pentecost the baptism of the Holy Spirit the outpouring of the Spirit you're talking about harvest you're talking about evangelism you're talking about the reason why the power is, of God is in the church it's to win the world for Jesus Christ. Look with me in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Now this again is Jesus talking after he has been resurrected. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. All right, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. So you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to be, receive power when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to be a witness for me in the uttermost parts of the world. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. So we see them when Jesus is talking about a commission. He's also talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about a commission, but he's saying wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. Look with me in Luke 24, verse 46. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. So Jesus is now talking about his death, burial, and resurrection after he has been resurrected. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. That is a reference to the Great Commission. Beginning in Jerusalem, verse 48. And you are witnesses of these things, verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, the outpouring of the Spirit, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So he says, I'm giving you a commission, but now I'm giving you the power to fulfill that commission. Don't even try to fulfill that commission until you receive the power to fulfill that commission. You see how God puts it all together. But here's the challenge. Because so very often as spirit-filled believers, we feel like the, the baptism with the Holy Spirit is given for personal edification, for spiritual enrichment in the life of the individual. And it is, because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the gateway to the gifts of the Spirit. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is the gateway to a prayer life in the spirit baptism of the holy spirit is the gateway to the anointing and the power and the presence of the holy spirit in your life it is that it certainly is that but why 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 it is the gateway to your uh, anointing it is the gateway to the gifting of the spirit it is the gateway to the grace of god upon your life because he wants you empowered to be a witness unto him it's not just about personal enrichment. It is about world evangelism. Somebody say, say it again. It's not just about, you all need to learn when to say these lines. It's not just about personal enrichment. It is about world evangelism. <laughs> no, you've missed your chance. I'm not going to say it again. <laughs> That's my wife down there. Say it again. <laughs> it, is about imper it is about personal enrichment, but, but that is only to get us to a place so that we are a witness for Jesus Christ. Now, now look, it says witness. It didn't say theologian. It said witness. You are a witness when you tell what you have seen and heard and know to be true. You're not baptized with the Holy Ghost and become an instant theologian. You are baptized with the Holy Ghost and you are a witness. 
Uh, I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was this, but now I'm that. Uh, before I met Jesus, I was this way. After I've come to Jesus, now I'm this way. Hallelujah. And you are a witness unto what God has done in your life. It doesn't mean that you're a theologian. Now, you will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. You will become a student of the Word. You will feast on the bread of life. Absolutely, all those things will happen. But when you are anointed, you are now equipped to tell somebody, you know what, I was headed to a devil's hell. Oh, Lord of mercy. But now I'm going to the Lord's paradise. Hallelujah. 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 When God called Peter, when Jesus called Peter, Peter was fishing, and Peter was a, a great fisherman. Peter was fishing, and Jesus said, you'll be a fisherman, and follow me, you'll be a fisherman of men. I'll make you into a fisher of men. In the same parallel passage, we read that th it was at that time that Peter had been out all night, caught nothing. And Jesus told him, launch out again. Let down your nets, and he caught, caught such a haul of fish that it broke the nets, filled the boats, almost sank the boats. It was more than they had ever caught before in their life. Jesus said, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And then he sent them out again, and they caught more fish than they have ever caught. In a place that they were just fishing. But at the word of God, apparently, now they've become productive. Now they've become prosperous. Now they're, caught, now they're pulling in more fish than they were ever prepared to pull in. It broke their nets. They didn't even have nets made strong enough for the haul that was coming in. So they were starting to see something in the natural. I'm going to make you a great fisher of men. So they started to see something in the natural, caught more fish than they've ever caught. But that's going to translate into a spiritual ministry because he's a fisherman of, he's a fisher of men. Jesus said, I'm going to make you a fisherman. Now, when did that happen? When did Jesus make him a fisher of men? On the day of Pentecost. For it was Peter that stood up. The anointing came in Acts chapter 2. The anointing came like a mighty rushing wind. It filled them all, cloven tongues of fire upon them. They spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. The masses gathered around them, thousands and thousands, from every nation, it says in Acts 2, from every nation gathered all around them. What is going on? Are you all drunk? And Peter stood up and said, no, this is the fulfillment of prophecy. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last day, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Glory to God. And your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Young men will see vision. Old men will dream dreams. Hallelujah. This is the evidence that the Holy Ghost is being poured out upon the church. Hallelujah. Peter became the evangelist when the Holy Ghost got on him. Now, how many people came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ at that one sermon? Peter's very first sermon. 3,000 souls were added to the church. His first sermon, 3,000 souls came added to the church. Why? Because something got on him. Hallelujah. Something got on him. Now, prior to that, Peter had been, been denying, hiding, and running away. But all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost got on him, and he's standing up in front of the multitudes, the very ones that had crucified Jesus Christ 50 days prior, and he's saying, listen, this is what we've been waiting for for centuries, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. If you'll just listen to me, I'll tell you how to receive the Spirit into your life. And 3,000 souls came to him and said, yes, that's what we've been looking for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We get our passion for souls from the Holy Ghost. That's the best place to get it. That's the true, honest, authentic place to get your passion for souls is from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
or evangelism, anointed evangelism, has to embrace three things. Has to embrace the Spirit's power, has to embrace the Spirit's love, and has to embrace the Spirit's strategy. Now you notice I did not say the pastor's power, the pastor's love, or the pastor's strategy. I did not say the seminar's power, or the seminar's love, or the seminar's strategy. Nope, I'm not talking about denominational power, denominational love, or denominational strategy. I'm talking about Holy Ghost, supernatural unction by the Spirit of God, born in the heart of the believer that is authored by the one that loves souls more than any other person on the planet. I'm talking about that which comes from the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Number one, let's embrace Holy Ghost power, Holy Ghost boldness, Holy Ghost fearlessness, and share this gospel message with as many people as we possibly can. Hallelujah. I said it's going to take boldness, but you've got boldness. Have you got the Holy Ghost? Are you a born-again believer? If not, we'll take care of it today. Have you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you? The Holy Ghost is bold. I said the Holy Ghost is bold. Acts chapter 4, verse 29. The early church was being threatened. And they prayed. They said, Lord, behold their threatenings. And grant to your servants that with all boldness. Everybody say boldness. boldness. Say, I am, bold. I am bold. That they may speak thy word with all boldness. Verse 30. By stretching forth thine hand to heal. That signs and wonders may be done in the name of thy holy child Jesus. Verse 31. Everybody say, get ready. Get ready. Say a whole lot of shakings coming on. Say, I'm starting to feel that shaking. Go ahead and reach over, grab your neighbor, and shake him real good. Say, do you feel it? Do you feel it? Yeah. And while they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. I, I tell you what, church. The church triumphant does not need to be a wallflower any longer. We need to get some boldness in our bones. We need to get some fire in our spirit. We need to stand up straight, put our head back, and start shouting it from the mountaintop that we have got the eternal message message to get people from the pits of hell into the paradise of heaven hallelujah Paul said in Romans 1 and 16 I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ is anybody in here not ashamed of the gospel of Christ say it out loud if you're not I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ say it again I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes Jew first then the Greek listen it's the power it's the only power it's the only way there is no other way there is one way there doesn't need to be many roads up the mountain there is one way up the mountain and that is through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. There's only one road to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There is no other way in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. I'm thrilled with this gospel. I'm excited about this gospel. I want to spend my life sharing this gospel. Joshua 1 and 9 says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You got the Holy Ghost on the inside. God's with you. He's the courage giver. He's the strength giver. He, he works on the inside of you. Oh, yeah, but, 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 but they might reject me, but they might not. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, somebody. So 
Number one, we have got to have the Spirit's power. That's God's prescription. Don't you go anywhere until you do with power from on high. Number two, we must embrace the Spirit's love for all people. Everybody say, all people. We got to love everybody. What this world needs is love. <laughs> God's love. Everybody's upset with everybody. But you know what? The church of Jesus Christ is the shining city on the hill where we have to demonstrate, where we have to manifest God's love in the earth today. And we got to love people that don't love us. I said we got to love. We got to love people that don't love us. We got to give them into, get them into heaven. I said we got to get, get them into heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah, they don't like us. They're evildoers. They want to undo us. They want to undermine us. They want to, listen, but you know what? Jesus died for them too. I said Jesus died for them too. If God can meet the, the, uh, the persecutor Saul on the Damascus Road and turn him to, into the apostle Paul in, in a heartbeat, God can take anybody. I said God can take anybody and turn them around. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. I said, oh, yes, hallelujah. That's the power of God. we got to share God's love. Romans 5 and 5, hope maketh not ashamed, but the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. we got God's love in our hearts, overflowing our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. we we got to love people that don't love us. we got to love people that aren't very nice. We got to love some folks that are evil doers. We got to love some folks that want to undo us. But you know what? We got to love them enough to share with them that they do not have to live the life that they are in, that God's got a better way, God's got an answer, and God can turn it around. I said, God can turn it around. Hallelujah. God can turn it around. No one is beyond the touch of God, no one is beyond the love of God. Hallelujah. He's a great preacher. I heard his testimony one time. He was a wild young man. He, he was a tattooed, wild, renegade, motorcycle, gang-type, wild thing. <laughs> I think that's what he said about himself. That may have been a quote. I'm not sure. He was a wild thing. And, and he came to Jesus, and he went to the first church that he came across and went in and saw the pastor, and he looked like a wreck. He, he had all the attitude that went with all the stuff, and, and uh, he told the pastor, he says, you know what, I want to do something for God. And that pastor took one look at him and said, God doesn't use people like you. Lord of mercy, let me tell you what, that was a lie from the pit of hell. We are saved by grace. God accepts all of us according to His grace. And God will use us for His glory. That was a lie from the pit of hell. God accepts us according to His grace. God loves us beyond measure. God seeks to do us good all day long. If you'll remember those three things, it'll change your life forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Do we feel a burden for the lost? Do we feel like we owe them a debt? Do, do we feel that we just cannot settle? We cannot sleep easy. We cannot put our head down at night until we see them come in to the kingdom of God. The Holy Ghost does not sleep or slumber. The Holy Ghost is after every single one of them. What did he tell the Apostle Paul? It's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to resist me. The Holy Ghost is after all of them, poking them, prodding them, trying to get them on to the right path. This is what the man Paul said about his countrymen. He so urgently and desperately wanted to see them come to Jesus. Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, New Living Translation. With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness, my conscience and the Holy Spirit confirms it. Verse 2. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ 
if that would save them. He said, I'll spend eternity in hell if it would save the nation. Now, he can't do it. He cannot make that exchange, but that was the burden that he felt. Lord, Lord, don't let these lost folks go to hell before I have a chance to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Give me the opportunity. I know there's going to be a shout. I know there's going to be a trump. But give us one more day, Lord. Give us one more opportunity to share the gospel with them, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 14, I'm a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as much as is, as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Hallelujah. I'm, I, I think that passion for souls is born out of the deepest gratitude for what God has done for us. We can never treat our salvation as, I've got mine, you're on your own. You know? I'm in, you may be out, good luck. <laughs> we can't do that. No, I'm in, come on, let me give you a hand. Let me, let, me, let me tell you what God's done for me. Let me tell you what God's done for me, hallelujah. Let me tell you what God's done for me. Oh, I, I know what you're feeling. I know where you're at. I know what you're doing. I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. I nearly ruined my life. I nearly lost my soul. People have that testimony, you know. People have that testimony. And God can turn a, a, a negative thing into a positive thing when you can use a testimony as a lifeline to drag somebody else out of the pits of hell and see them come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yes, he can. I said, yes, he can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul wrote to Timothy, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. Verse 16, but God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners when others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. You may be thinking, how could God ever forgive me? You may be thinking, how could God ever cleanse me? You may be thinking, how could I ever be a child of the living God? And Jesus said, if you'll just come to the foot of the cross, I'm going to pour my blood out on you. I'm going to forgive you of your sins. I'm going to change your life. I'm going to make you into a new creation. And you know what used to be a curse? I'm going to turn it into a blessing because that what people used to criticize you about is going to become a testimony in your life. And it's going to drag other people out from the pits of hell hallelujah 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 number three we have to embrace the spirit strategy for evangelism and I'm going to close on this the spirit strategy for evangelism and here it is this is as simple as I can say it the spirit strategy for evangelism is sowing and watering that's it you don't have to win people in the sense that you can't save them you couldn't save yourself how can you save anybody else but you can sow and you can water God gives the increase 1st Corinthians 3 and 9 1 Corinthians 3 and 5. Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, verse 6, I planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. You notice, I, I'm just responsible for the sowing. And maybe I'm watering what someone else has sowed. Maybe what I sow, someone else is going to come along and water, but God gets the increase. It's God who saves the soul. I'm not saving anybody. I'm just sowing and watering, sowing and watering, sowing and watering. 
And sometimes that which is sown is going to fall on wayward, thorny, rocky, but sometimes, whoo, sometimes it's good ground. Sometimes it falls on good ground. And, and I, don't, I don't always know when I'm sowing. I don't know if that's good ground or that's rocky ground, but I'm going to sow, glory to God. I'm going to sow the good news, the incorruptible seed of God's Word. I'm going to sow it. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Someone else is going to come along and water it. Hallelujah. And God is going to call them to the foot of the cross, and they're going to give their heart to Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what I'm responsible for, the sharing and the sending. I can't say, but I can share the gospel. I can send those others to the mission field. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So I pray for doors of opportunity. Colossians 3, I mean 4 and 3, pray that God will give us many opportunities to speak this mysterious, mysterious plan concerning Christ. Verse 4, pray that I will be able to proclaim this message with clarity. Verse 5, make the most of every opportunity. And there it is. And there it is. We embrace the power of the Spirit. We embrace the love of the Spirit. And we embrace the strategy of the Spirit. As the Spirit births in our heart a passion for souls. Every person we will walk past today has a soul that will either spend eternity in heaven or in hell. I know where I'm going to spend my eternity. No question about it. Heaven. Despite all my faults and failures and shortcomings, I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. How about you? Don't you wish everybody would? What a world that would be. Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. Would you like a passion in your heart? The same passion passion as the Holy Spirit has for souls. If that's you, say amen. amen. Oh, if that's you, say amen. amen. If you want Holy Ghost passion in your life, say amen. amen. Oh, thank you, Lord, for Holy Ghost, for Holy Ghost passion in the life of the believer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that we are in a point in the life of this nation that the church must rise up I said the church must rise up and speak forth revival into this nation it's going to tip one way or the other and it is our responsibility to rise up and say you know what we have got a message that we want you to hear and it is going to change the heart of the individual it is going to change their family it is going to change their neighborhood it is going to change their nation it is going to change this country and we will see things I said we will see revival ushered in to the do you want to see that? I said, do you want, will you stand with me? Hallelujah.